Assalamu alaikum and peace. Uh, welcome to Muslim Network TV. Uh, you're watching us on Galaxy 19 Satellite, Amazon Fire TV, uh, Raku, Apple TV. Uh, we're 24-7. Uh, you can download our app on uh, iPhone or Android, just Muslim Network TV. Our website is muslimnetwork.tv. And we are coast to coast, north to south, east to west in uh, North America and uh, around the world through our website and other means. Thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you will watch and enjoy this program. Uh, Muslims are all around the world, and uh, a good number of them are in former colonies, uh, for, oh, sorry, former uh, countries which, which colonize Muslims. And one such country is uh, United Kingdom. Uh, there are close to 5 million Muslims there. Uh, they have um, dozens of television, while we Muslims in America have, this is the only thing which we have, Muslim Network TV. And they are organized. Um, they have far higher level of representation in the uh, in the parliament, both houses, House of Common and House of Lords. Close to 35 uh, Muslims are there. But that was not the case uh, <clears throat> 15, 20 years ago. <coughs> there was just one person who were in the House of Commons. And then gradually, so, so how British Muslim uh, transformed, uh, but how they are part of the society, uh, what is happening in UK, what are the challenges there? Uh, there was a big division on the issue of Brexit, uh, but then the party who was in support of Brexit uh, became uh, bigger and bigger and have more power. British used to speak up on human rights. Are they still doing the same? Uh, what is the current situation? To discuss that with us is a person who is uh, uh, a well-established um, in the uh, United Kingdom. On one side, he's leader of Muslims and a scholar and a writer uh, who is not originally born there, but used to serve in the Bangladeshi Air Force and then came to UK, became part of the UK, and now he's uh, Deputy Lieutenant, uh, which is a, a, some type of a very high level of honorable position, uh, which uh, connects you with the royalty and you, um, you perform certain purposes like judges in the United States. They take uh, oath of citizenship. Uh, over there, uh, uh, Deputy Lieutenant on behalf of Royal take oath of citizenship and things of this nature. So with me to discuss UK and the UK Muslim community and other ideas uh, is Dr. Abdul Bari. Asalaamu Alaikum. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Thank you, Imam Mujahid. Thanks for having me. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Abdul Bari is a noted British civic leader, educationist, uh, parenting consultant and author. He serves as, uh, in the past as a chair of the Muslim Council of Britain, which is a representative body of Muslims uh, in UK. Well, first let me start out, uh, you know, Britain and UK, if I call you British, uh, is it acceptable to all the people in UK or it is not? Yes, anybody who is a British citizen, they are British and I am proud to be British and uh, proud in the sense that human beings have multiple identities and uh, ethnic identity, cultural identity, religious identity and all sorts of identities. So we have multiple identities. Nationally, I am British. And also, because I live in London, I'm a proud Londoner. So what happened to UK then? So you're not you, you, UK-ish or something? Well, UK is the, is the kingdom, four kingdoms. So this is, the, this is the formal name, but it's known as Britain. So when I say Muslim Council of Britain, it's Muslim Council, Council of the United Kingdom. So Britain is used uh, probably more than anything else. UK is a bit formal. And uh, although British are known to be very formal, 
but um, we are also proud of being informal. <laughs> okay, <laughs> proud of being informal. I like that. So, so what is happening in Britain now? What are the uh, current situation? Are people happy there? What is happening with Brits? You know, the whole uh, pandemic uh, is it under control? Well, Brexit situation came in from 2016, so it is lingering, and we are in a crunch moment. As the last moment, our prime minister is going to be in the in in Brussels to discuss with the European Commission head, and things are very tough. You know, uh, Europe has learned the art of negotiation over centuries, so Britain is coming out formally, and uh, that's the will of the people. And but the negotiation is continuing, and uh, there are a, quite a, a number of hiccups. And my personal hunch is for Britain's interest and Europe's interest, there is a deal, and that deal needs compromise. And I believe, I'm not 100% sure, I believe there will be compromise. That's one major issue that has been hanging on us for the last four years. But recently, recently means for since um, end of March, but since end of February of, uh, or March, in the beginning of March, the pandemic came, and that had that has disproportionately affected British people in terms of infection, in terms of death. Unfortunately, Britain has the highest number of deaths in Europe, although proportion of population-wise is not is not in the top. But uh, in, 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 the, in the whole of Europe, is uh, proportionately is, is the highest number. And um, also the, in the second wave, uh, there has been lots of struggles going on. In the first wave, many uh, people died because that was the initial stage. And those who were in the front line, those who were in the, say, hospital doctors or nurses or those who dealt with the patients in the ICU, and uh, many of them are Muslims. And in Britain, Muslims are 5%, but the uh, medical profession or in the health profession, we have got around 10, 12% in the national uh, representation. And uh, so there has been a number of criticisms of the, of the government as to how they handled the situation in the beginning. And then summer went and the, we finished just the another lockdown for one month and now the country is going through some tier system. The first tier or initial tier is a bit a bit less restricted. Second tier where we are, London is in the second tier, uh, is uh, quite restricted. And the third tier is the highest. So I think 90% of British population are either in tier two or tier three. And um, still the um, uh, fatality rate is highest in Europe. Hmm. But the good thing is, uh, Britain is the first country in the whole world that has started vaccinating people, and and that this vaccination is from uh, from the Pfizer and uh, RNT Tech. Hmm. Yeah, the RNT Tech is that uh, <clears throat> couple of uh, uh, German Muslim couple. German Turkish. Um, yeah. Okay. So so but but Britain itself has a. Uh, a, a um, Oxford, what, what they call it, they were developing their own vaccine. So why oh, yeah, this yeah. one? The, the Ox Oxford one is waiting and that there, there, there is another one coming. So there will be three global vaccines in the, in the I, I can say capitalist world, although, um, uh, China and Russia, they are having different ones. Russia's one is the Sputnik, but AstraZeneca, is being researched and nearly in the final stage that is from Oxford and Moderna is probably mainly American but um, Britain has subscribed to a few millions of the um, uh, Pfizer, yeah. Pfizer one. Okay so in, in what is the reason of higher level of uh, death uh, in the UK? In UK, I think Britain has crossed sixty-two thousand, and is quite high. I think it's probably the fourth in the whole world. Why? Why it is that high? Um, there has been lots of reason, and some of the criticism is is now going towards the government because the government was not initially well prepared in equipping the health professionals, those who were working in the hospitals, 
is to his personal personal protection equipment was short in number and um, and uh, hospitals somehow were coping especially a big hospital was uh, was formed was founded within within 10 15 days uh, but the problem was many of the health professionals became themselves ill and uh, amongst them many prominent muslim doctors four senior muslim doctors consultant level they passed in the first few weeks and um, then of course others from the bme community we call bme is black and asian minority ethnic communities and one of the reasons there are there may be many reasons one of the reasons is um normally ba bame community minority communities are not that well off compared to the wider society and they also their job is in the front line either in the say uh, in the hospital um, front front doctors or nurses or uh, those who service these hospital patients uh, patients and others and many of them do come from the minority communities and uh, because the preparation was not that um, strong according to many observers preparation was really really weak and I have personally um, seen that because one of my sons is a medical professional. So there has been lots of criticism of the government in the first wave, during the first wave of this lockdown. And even during this uh, summer uh, breakdown when things were a bit, uh, a bit, a bit loose, a bit um, light, uh, preparation for this second wave, uh, that has been lots of criticism. And that's one factor. The other one, and the care homes were were virtually neglected um, wittingly or un unwittingly and many people elderly people passed away and they are they are those who served them they also passed away so i think i hope this is going to be a lesson for britain because it's it's uh, one of the most developed countries in the world and infrastructure has been strong NACs is wonderful national health service and uh, i was wondering i mean uh, it, you know national service is available to all people yeah unlike in the united states access to health uh, services is universal so why the higher level of death rate while the system is available to all people well as i mentioned um, uh, that's from my observation and the observation in the media and observation from the experts that government was not fully ready and mm -hmm. if the health professionals who are not getting enough equipment to protect themselves working in the icu working in the hospital working in the accident and emergency and all these main areas then obviously the the fatality rates uh, were was higher amongst the medical professionals so, and one of my one of my close friends uh, he is a, he, he has been a doctor he spent 146 days in the hospital 120 days in the uh, icu intensive care unit 75 days in with oxygen but fortunately alhamdulillah he survived and he survived he's a very strong personal personality and uh, he has got better and he's he has started writing but this is an exception but this also the different variants of pandemic uh, virus is a, is another another difficult areas so um, 126 days in icu 70 100 and 120 days in icu 75 days in with oxygen oxygen is totally unconscious hmm substantial uh, and he survived i mean he survived and he is he is alhamdulillah he's he's he he has a start he's a good writer he's a along with being a medical professional he's a very good writer and he has started writing well, well it's an inspiration for many we hope that we will be able to interview him one of these days that's just simply amazing uh, that's where you believe you know god uh, controls life and death i mean we have well, yeah, a yeah. person uh, she is 102 year old mm -hmm. and she survived the last pandemic in uh, in 19 uh, 1918 or something like that mm -hmm. 
and she has been uh, she she became ill twice because of the covid 19 and she still survives <laughs> so so life and yeah. death are yeah. resilience uh, we can try to understand human body and come up with medicines yeah. but ultimately it's not uh, the only variable which decide. Yeah. Uh, talking a little bit about Brexit, uh, Brexit. Uh, so we'll take a short break. When we come back, I'd like to know how Brexit, you know, UK was evenly divided on that issue on uh, whether we should join or not join, I mean, leave or not leave. Yeah, it was divided, especially the then Prime Minister David Cameron. He thought that it will be an, it will be cakewalk. <laughs> cakewalk means it would be easy for him to win. And he gave this referendum. He was not duty bound, probably. And I, we, many of us criticized uh, that he gave this <clears throat> referendum. But he thought he would win. But what happens? Few of his very close lieutenants and very powerful and very charismatic. One of them is the current prime minister. And uh, this current prime minister, he wrote two articles and they didn't publish. And one of them was for Brexit, one of them against Brexit. Imagine how divided he himself was personally. Towards the end, he probably saw a political future or saw that uh, the, the wind is changing in a different way. He just departed the uh, then Prime Minister, David Cameron, and that tilted the weight. And also there have been some very powerful, sharp-witted, um, um, advisors who devise some posters and uh, uh, some of the things that uh, Britain has been under subjugation of Europe, we have to be independent. In one of the posters, um, it was mentioned that uh, if Britain lives, um, um, keeps staying in, in, in the EU, then Turkish, 80 to 90 million Turkish people may come to Britain. It was absurd and total lie. But people bought that, this sort of propaganda. So, so all these factors, all these factors were me. So it means there was some racial undertone to this thing as well. There was a racial undertone and another, another, uh, another advertisement, um, a um, busload of uh, immigrants. These pictures in the posters were shown in a way that people thought that, okay, if we, if we stay in Europe, then we are, we are, we are in trouble. So that was the, uh, some people call it a devious plan. On the other hand, the, uh, those who wanted to remain in Europe, their performance was obviously weaker compared to those who wanted to leave. Uh, we'll take a short break. Uh, you're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Majid Malik Mujahid talking with Dr. Abdul Bari. We'll be right back after these messages. My wife, who uh, she's a professor at the University of Cincinnati, who, who's Catholic, and by her watching and listening to our three-year-old son uh, watch Adam's World, she ended up taking Kalima Shahada. She embraced Islam because she learned so much about Islam and the other prophets. It really affected our life in a great way, and because of uh, Sound Vision and Adam's World, we're Muslims. I took my Shahada 15 years ago, and I actually am from a rural part of Ohio. And so I found the catalog for Sound Vision, and I ordered the the tapes and the CDs and the books, and I use those, and especially for my little daughter, you know, that's how we basically learned our Islam and Islam entered our hearts through the wonderful works of, of Sound Vision. Okay, Assalamu alaikum, brother. I just want you to know that I love the Sound Vision website, that a lot of times when I'm looking for information, especially as it relates to homelessness, domestic violence, and women issues, I go to that website, and then I see what you've written, and then I copy and paste it, and spread the word, because the wisdom is there, so I can't you know, I can't do any better than what Sound Vision has already done. Sound Vision is our survival uh, uh, guide. It is the uh, organization that provides skills for Muslims how to survive and thrive in this uh, community here in the U.S. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Anam, I'm in 11th grade and I grew up with Adam's World and what it taught me was unity, respect and love for the Muslim Ummah. Is Adam's World is the greatest show ever made. Take me to the Kaaba, man. I love that puppet.
Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with Dr. Abdul Bari uh, from UK. So uh, Britain and uh, United States uh, have often taken a stand together for human rights. Um, of course, uh, most of the time <clears throat> they take a stand when it is uh, in line with their uh, own foreign policies. I have not seen much principled support for human rights by any countries, you know, the national interest or rights, the human rights interest. Uh, but lately I have seen the US and uh, Britain have uh, uh, moved away. They don't provide leadership on the issues of human rights and German and uh, Canada and Germany and sometimes France, they speak up more often. So what is uh, what is the situation? Why why this transition has happened? Or do you think it is the case? Um, there could be mixed opinion on this. Those who are those who are probably pro government, they will say, well, no, they are they are doing well. Uh, I try to be always in the middle. I think there has been some weaknesses, definitely. And I can personally mention <clears throat> because I was I wrote a book on the Rohingya situation, Rohingya Muslims in uh, Myanmar, and uh, Britain's performance from the government level, civil so civil society level, that has been wonderful. Amnesty Inter International and British British civil society, and we have been taking part in some of the things. But um, business as usual from the government, unfortunately. Um, one reason could be economic because um, Britain is in the process of leap time. I always call Britain or UK is always in the in the process of leaving uh, Europe, EU, uh, not Europe, it's EU. And uh, the business of our country with Europe is about 40, uh, 46% Britain's international dealings. And it has to find, the country has to find a lot of other countries to do the business so that this can be compensated. So business obviously for any developed country business is always an interest. And also um, politics, when politics gets divided, uh, like in America, uh, here are, um, Tory party or conservative party, which is, is, which is having government for the last 10 years, um, because there is not that much challenge from a from an opposition party, which is Labour, then obviously um, complacency comes in because the challenge, if the challenge is weaker in the parliament or in the public domain, then obviously things will go uh, slowly or things things um, moral dimension probably will be will not come that much and um, and because of the Brexit division because of the COVID situation things are things are overall slow and people are not sure about what's happening next week or next month in terms of COVID 19 in terms of Brexit negotiation, the whole period of Theresa May's government's struggle, and that became really, really very frustrating for any citizen of the country. Now that the current government led by Boris Johnson bulldozed virtually, we can use this term, um, and it has got absolute majority, but unfortunately Labour has faltered in the electoral electoral position. So there could be these multiple, multiple, multiple factors, economy, politics, COVID, Brexit, and also these people's civil society is also very busy um, sustaining itself and helping these people who are suffering. Let's talk about the Muslim community. Uh, how many Muslims are there in, uh, in Britain? 2011 census say the uh, Muslims are 2.78 million, but there was a there was a um, independent report in 2017. It says 3.1 million. Next year, 2011, there will be another census. So until we have this uh, full census, we will not be able to know. But maybe three to 3.3 million, 
which is just 5% of British population or one in 20th. Unfortunately, some in the right or far right group try to say that Muslims are one fifth of the community. One fifth means 20%. We are one in 20, not one, not one fifth. Why do they say that uh, Muslims are 20% of the community? Well, some of them want to, want to show the big figure to show that the country is being taken over by these, by these, by these, by these, by these Muslims. Fear, fear of Muslims. Fear uh, of Muslims. Fear, fear yeah. of Muslim yeah. and with racist undertone. Well, well, you know, that that you mentioned in Brexit also, the 80 million Turkish people are coming there. And <laughs> part and parcel of this. Why, why, I mean, uh, was it under your leadership that the Muslim community demanded that Muslims be counted as a census, as a religion wise? Well, why that decision was that is, that is a long story because um, until 20, 2001, uh, census, there, religion was not at all there. Religion means no, there is no number of Christian, Jews, and others. So religion was just bypassed because it's a secular society. Uh, before 2001 census, Muslim Council of Britain came in 1997. We realized that the number of Muslims or religious people is important for the service that they get in the hospital, in the food, and many other in many other many other areas, hospitals and other areas, prisons. The number is important. Say for Muslims, say Muslims take normally normally Muslims take halal meat, and if you don't know the number of say prison or in the the hospital, then how do you provide it? How do you demand? So MCB started working with. Christians, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, and major religions formed a coalition. And, and if then under the leadership of some uh, Church of England leaders, we went, women's MCB and Muslims went to the relevant department of the government. Initially, government said it's nothing. It's that we are a secular country. Why are you coming for this? Gradually, the demand was high and high. They agreed. And in 2011, the then government accepted that the religious um, um, figure should be counted in the census. That's how the number, number came. And it was not compulsory. And uh, it still is not compulsory. It's only religious affiliation, nothing else. But that gave a give boost that uh, Muslims know the formal number present in the UK. There could be many informal people didn't cross, did not take it. So that's, that's another thing. And 2000, uh, in 2001, the number was 1.6 according to the census. 2011, number was um, number was 2.78, and hopefully in 2021, number will be slightly higher than 3 million. And this number is important not because Muslims want to want to show their show their force because we are a small minority, but it's for all faith communities for their benefit in the education sector, in the hospital sector, in the prison, in different areas, the number has been proved really, really useful. Nobody has ever said that this, the uh, giving the number in the census has been wrong. Nobody says this. So, so do you think uh, this was developing a, a statistical information how yeah. Muslim, yeah. Is Muslims and other minorities articulate their demands properly? Articulate their dem citizenship demands, say, uh, for Muslims, say halal meat is important. For other communities, something else is important. And everybody can say that, look, this is our number, and we need, we need, we, you need to help us. Would you say then, because of that census decision, mm -hmm. uh, Muslim influence on domestic uh, policies has increased somewhat? I think not only this one. It's overall some impact has Muslim have given some impact to the society overall for many reasons. One is initially people came as a refugee, not refugee, so immigrant, and they wanted to go back. Pakistan and Bangladesh, 67% Muslims in this country are of Pakistan and Bangladesh origin, historical reasons. As just in the beginning said, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India were, were British colonies. So naturally, um, people from Jamaica, Jamaica or East Indies and um, South Asia came to, came to England. So, but what happens as time passed, very few people did go back. 
initially they used to go and they brought their own wives and children rather than they were going back. And then students came, professionals came, number started becoming bigger. And now first generation, second generation, third and fourth generation children now are in the public service. So the impact of these new generation of young Muslims getting into the various professions, high level professions, finance, medicine and others, that has a social impact. In the beginning, people were working in the factory or restaurants. That didn't have that much social impact. But once children, my two children work in the finance sector. One is a doctor and one is a pharmacist. So this is just not me. It's like many of people in my generation. So naturally, once, this, once the education level goes up and they get better jobs, they go to the better houses away from the inner city deprived areas, things socially, culturally, politically, and economically, economically, economically change. So, so, so there is a higher level of impact on public policy because of the participation and social mobility. What about uh, foreign policy? I mean, UK is far closer to different, uh, you know, flight wise, uh, physical distance to the Muslim majority countries uh, is far closer and their elite normally comes there. So, so and, and the colonial ties. So what is the influence of uh, British Muslims on British foreign policy? Um, mixed mixed uh, response. On some areas, Muslims have a strong voice and that is noted especially during the time of Blair government. <clears throat> and um, he was elected in 1997. In the first, his first term, uh, he really, really listened to British uh, ordinary people as well as Muslims as well. And Muslims got lots of recogni formal recognition during his first term. But sadly, after 9-11 and the Af Afghanistan war and Iraq invasion, uh, the relationship between the Blair government and Muslim became sour because Blair wanted Muslim support in his invasion uh, along with the uh, pres um, American president and Muslim Council of Britain and major organization or Muslim didn't support that. So that created some blowbacks and 7-7 um, and atrocity came and that created problems for Muslims as well. So foreign policy wise, um, there are some, and also there is a factor, another factor. Um, Britain has a commonwealth of nations, and they are those who, uh, which are their former colonies, and uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and all India, and all, all, all these countries, uh, around 50, 50 plus countries. That has a huge impact in terms of not only, it, it doesn't have any hard impact, but a soft impact. And Britain's education, Britain's, Britain's medicine, Britain's publicity and etc everything uh, they are soft powers and many of the commonwealth countries emulate or try to emulate uh, britain's uh, qualities in education and other areas so in that way if not hard impact uh, and and also when um, um, muslim council of britain it consists of 500 affiliates and it's the largest um, umbrella organization, representative umbrella group. So any foreign visitors of importance, uh, they come to Britain for visit. And uh, in the past, during the Blair's uh, uh, first, first term and second term, many of them formally came to MCB, Muslim Council, Council of Britain office, and met, we discussed with Singapore, Malaysia, and Nigeria. And gradually this thing, uh, after the coalition government came, under uh, David Cameron that has been subsided. But still, Muslim community coming from across the world, um, they have got their family link, they have got their links in different ways, uh, economic links, family, cultural, linguistic links, that has an impact. We'll take a short break. You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid talking with Dr. Abdul Bari from UK, and we'll be right back after these messages. Oh, 
Assalamu alaikum everyone, it's your brother Zain Bika from South Africa. One of the first educational programs ever produced for Muslim children was the ever popular Adam's World series. The colorful and comical Muslim puppets stole the heart of a generation. Sound Vision will be releasing brand new episodes of Adam's World with the launch of a Adam's World app. Subscribers will enjoy new Adam's World episodes as they are released as well as all the classic episodes of Adam's World. So visit adamsworldapp.com now to learn more, subscribe and enjoy new adventures of Adam and his friends. And let's keep helping tomorrow's Muslims today. Assalamu alaikum. Adam's World. Believe me, there's a lot to see. Bismillah. Let's explore. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid talking with Dr. Abdul Bari. Uh, tell us a little bit about history of uh, Muslims in UK. You know, uh, the uh, two of the most popular translations of the Quran by uh, uh, Mitchell and uh, Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Uh, they were British, it seems. Yeah, they were. They, they... Um, Abdul Yusuf Ali was an Indian civil servant, and also Marmaduke the Pictol was a bit was a British indigenous Britain, British, and he was a classmate of Churchill in Eton College, who is the number one number one in terms of uh, providing prime ministers in this country. Current prime minister comes from this country, and former David Cameron was also in Eton College, and uh, <clears throat> so Muslim history goes back long ago. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there has been uh, there has been history. I wrote this in my uh, long jihad book, uh, my memoir, that in the eighth century there was a king who minted a coin in Muslim kalima, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. It's in the British Museum. Either he was hugely influenced by Muslims, or he had very good links with Muslims because Muslims were there in Spain at the time, southern France and Spain and uh, Portugal. So that's one, and the crusade happened, so good or bad, whatever happens, that linked uh, Britain with uh, the Muslim world. And of course, when the Spanish armada, Spain wanted to, Spain was the superpower at the time, wanted to invade Britain, Britain is a small island. Ottoman Sultanate supported Queen Elizabeth, British queen at the time, and uh, so the Spanish armada didn't happen. And then unfortunate colonialism, and post-colonial migration. So Muslim history goes back that, but in the in the modern context, uh, uh, the, in the first quarter of uh, 20th century, last century, 100 years ago, all these great people started working in, in, in London. 
And one of the mosques that I chaired, Islona Mosque, that was conceived by Syed Amir Ali, prominent historian of Bengali ethnic origin, but Indian civil servant. He was the first field counselor of Britain. And he got hold of quite a number of significant lords, academics, and uh, uh, different rich people to form a mosque, found a mosque in, Islam, in, in, in the heart of the British Empire at the time. And uh, <clears throat> so the Islam Mosque history goes to 1910. And before that, um, the Oking Mosque came in 1889. That is the first established mosque that has been surviving. But a few years ago, uh, the Oking Mosque was established in 1889. Um, uh, Abdullah Quilliam, he was a prominent solicitor lawyer in Liverpool. And he, he um, accepted Islam and he was criticized for that. And Turkish Ottoman Empire uh, counted him as the Sheikh al Islam of Britain. And he built a mosque before Oking Mosque, but that mosque did not survive. But new owners of this area has uh, built that mosque again. So mosque ba goes back, say, 1889. Islam Mosque 1910, and then there are uh, hundreds of mosques. And of course, simultaneously, many Bengalis and others came in the Marsan Navy, worked in Marsan Navy, settled there. They were not prominent that much at, at that time. There was no community. And many Somalians and Yemeni people came and settled in some places. But the modern history of Muslim communities emergence started after the Second World War. Uh, especially many Pakistanis at, this, at that time, East Pakistan was Pakistan, Bengalis, Punjabis, and their um, people of uh, Kashmir origin came. And from 60s and 70s onward, number flourished. Now, people don't come that many in number, but their children, uh, their grandchildren, and uh, their great grandchildren are now uh, taking the responsibilities of their community as well as and uh, working with the wider society. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the challenges Muslim face. I mean, you, your, your memoirs are called A Long Jihad. Uh, you know, it seems like it is not only your memoirs, but uh, it is sort of interconnected uh, with the struggle of British Muslims. Uh, so, so is is the life of British Muslims is a long ongoing jihad? Well, I think any Muslim life is ongoing jihad wherever they live, because internal jihad is constant, and our own whims and desires and conscience continually struggle together. But uh, obviously, um, British British Muslims have had a good time before nine eleven and seven seven. Good, good time is relatively good time. There was racism, very coarse racism means open racism. But uh, Britain came up with very powerful regulations, Citizenship Act, or different different laws, uh, anti racist anti racist laws, and equality laws. And Britain, we can be proud of that. That Britain is happened in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and that sort of took away the direct, hard-hitting uh, racism from Britain, especially in the beginning, I heard, I haven't seen it. And um, uh, uh, people went into bars and uh, at that time the coin was given to the ticket collector and the white ticket collector was not ready to take money from a black, black, uh, black person because that hand, hand, hand will be touched. So these sort of things are a story I heard. But this is now things of the past. But uh, there is a subtle um, discrimination, prejudice constantly going on. And it's not only in Britain, it's probably in every society it happens. Anybody who is seen to be a threat in terms of number, in terms of influence, in terms of culture or cultural expression, uh, that is a reality. But he yeah. seems to be a bit of a proud uh, British man. Uh, you say that UK has the least Islamophobia as compared to Europe. Well, I, I'm coming to that. Britain has come up with a multiculturalism, and this term has been criticized now. But by multiculturalism, I mean that giving people the religious freedom and freedom of anything provided they follow the British law. And diversity has been accommodated. 
unlike France, there is only one type of citizenship. It's the French government decides and you cannot be anything else. You don't have any Muslim or other identity. It's the French identity. Britain has accommodated British Muslim, British Christian, British Jew, British. That means you can be British as well as you can have your religious identity. So in that sense, British multicultural or pluralist culture that has developed from since 1960s and 70s has been very, very accommodative. And also some of the structural institutions, um, <clears throat> there is a race equality in your, um, equality and human rights commission and there has been in many ways. And uh, that has benefited and many prominent academics from minority communities and majority communities work together to come to this level. So Islamophobia is obviously uh, is plenty and nobody can deny that because Tory party has been accused of Islamophobia and now Labour party is being accused of uh, having Islamophobia. Anti-Semitism hopefully is a matter of the past but it's still there. So this racial or religious prejudice I think will remain until the day until the day of the world but how you manage this and whether if anybody is 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 harmed or anybody's prejudice get recourse in the eye of the law that will tell the nature of civility and democracy uh, uh, of a society and Britain is far better compared to say France. I can confidently say that in front of macro, I can, I, I can, I can say this. And some other European countries like Hungary and others where um, um, my, minorities, especially Muslims are treated as invaders. How so, Muslim Council of Britain, which is the United Body of Muslims in UK has uh, helped uh, my, it, the civic engagement and influence of Muslim community as well as the broader society? It has a huge influence on the Muslims because Muslims come from four corners of the world. Uh, probably uh, there was a research when there was a 20, 2012 Olympic Games. 300 languages is spoken in, in, in London itself. It's a, it's a microcosm of whole of humanity and Muslims come from all sorts of backgrounds. So because of this background and people coming in different times, a different education, different culture, different religious explanation, Muslims, Muslims are not a monolithic group. We call ourselves a community of communities. And in one sense, MCB came to more or less harmonize most of the Muslim elements. Still, we cannot, MCB cannot claim that they represent everyone. MCB represents 500 affiliates, but these 500 affiliates probably represents many segments of Muslims in the country. So that's one thing. You know, on the other thing, on the other hand, many communities are not that uh, diverse, say Hindu community or the Jewish community, and the uh, Jewish community can be categorized as one race. Sikh community is another race, that's why they fall under the, the Race Relations Act. Muslims do not fall under any Race Relations Act. So because of this, um, there are diverse, op divergent opinions of Muslims. But unfortunately, that's one of the part of Islamophobia that right wing, especially far right tab tabloid media and some politicians try to portray Muslims as one monolithic community. One criminal puts some bombs somewhere and kills some people. He sadly is seen to be represented as, 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 a, as Muslims. We challenge them, we have been challenging this, when IRA bombing was there, nobody said that IRA bombers are Catholic terrorists. But the problem is sane people or sensible people having common sense, they understand, And but the sections of the media and some politicians, um, they don't care about this because social media and sometimes media, um, is, is sometimes it becomes a vote winner it becomes very populist. If you can say something against a community which people probably don't like, you you get you get the praise of your supporters. Hmm. So, so Muslim Council of Britain, uh, with their contribution bringing Muslims together, uh, and then they develop coalitions with other other entities. Uh, I mean, in United States, Muslims are in multiple uh, coalitions. 
And I heard the London Citizen is one of the major coalition you have been part of. So tell us about how Muslims together are developing coalitions with others in the society for the common good. Okay. MCBK, Muslim Council of came through the coalition of Muslim organizations and we started work from 1994 and it took nearly three and a half years to come up and form the organization. London Citizens, it is now known as Citizens UK. It started with East London Communities Organization. It's the model that Chicago, the Chicago model, uh, industrial, industrial. I, I think you, we, we probably would be knowing industrial the area foundation. Yeah. And Obama, Obama was a community organizer. So someone called Neil Jameson is very close to me, my close friend. In the mid '90s, he came to East London Mosque because he wanted to start something from East London because East London has the has had the highest number of Muslims proportionately, and East London Mosque, East London Mosque was was the largest. So we became friends. We started this East London Communities Organization in, in the mid-90s. It became gradually London citizens because we were organizing not only communities, we were organizing citizens. We sometimes call it called community organizing, organizing but in, in terms of citizens, it's citizens organizing and community and citizens more or less synonymous. So London citizens came and came up with the living waste campaign, the lower salaried people should be given higher money so that they can maintain their family. That is one of the most successful projects that <clears throat> Citizens UK had under, undertaken and 5,000 plus major national organizations, banks and others have agreed that a, while the government's minimum wage is seven pound something, Citizens UK's demand is 10 point something in pound um, in, in London and out of London, nine, nine pound something. And that brought hundreds of thousands of people out of poverty. And there are many other things that Citizens UK had been doing in collaboration with Muslims. So here they joined together. We, work, we started works parallelly, MCB and Citizens UK, but on many areas because many Muslim organizations are part of Citizens UK, part of Muslim Council of Britain and centrally, uh, we have been working together. So. But Citizens UK is a civil society, grassroots leadership building community. MCB is the Muslim umbrella group. So this is just, uh, well, thank you so much for being with us. I mean, that's the contribution. I mean, hundreds and thousands of people being brought out of poverty. Lifted out of poverty, yeah. And, uh, uh, and it, it happened with the full participation of the Muslim community with their allies in the society. So while the government is doing something, civil society people are working hand in hand. Uh, and that is uh, that what will please uh, God Almighty, uh, you know, all prophets were sent down by God Almighty. So help people establish justice, fairness and equity. And that's what you achieve. So thank you so much, Dr. Abdulbari, for sparing a good amount of time with us uh, from UK. And thank you, Sherdil Khan and Dr. Abdul Wahid for producing today's show. And thank you for watching. Muslim Network TV brings you whole world here. Uh, we're 24 seven on Galaxy 19 satellite, uh, reaching 57 million people throughout North America, cover to uh, east to west, north to south, as well as Apple TV, Amazon, T Amazon Fire TV, Raku, and you can download our, our app on uh, your iPhone or Android, Muslim Network TV. And our website is muslimnetwork.tv. Well, that's mouthful of Muslim Network TV. Thank you so much. Stay tuned for other programming. Peace. Salam.